All right, quiz preview for tomorrow. Oh no, open-ended questions to start. So let's see here. When referring to rational expression operations, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, when do you need to have a common denominator in order to do it? Add and subtract. Add and subtract. Because with multiply and divide, we can start canceling right away, and we really don't care if there's a common denominator or not. It's a good deal there. When trying to simplify, any rational expression that involves quadratic polynomials, that just sounds so technical. What should be your first step? Factor. Yes, factor if possible. I am with you. Now on the rest, a couple of hints, but also make sure you don't do more work than you have to. Okay, so what are the least common denominators for the following expressions? Again, do not do all the complete adding and building fractions. Just what's the common denominator? Who, what, where? Okay. Right, because again, with these, remember, when I'm looking for an LCD, there's three things to look for. Okay. If you have any coefficients, if you have any lonely single numbers, we have to deal with those like we would a fraction from back in like grade school or middle school. Then we look to see if there's any single variables. And if there are, we're going to take, oh, keep scooting, Hardy. We're going to take the largest exponent that we see on one of them. And then finally, we look for our unique quantities, or our sets of parentheses. And that kind of takes on the same rule. If there is one with an exponent, if there's a squared one, we're going to take the squared part. So we need to look for those three things and kind of run down the checklist. So this first one, I don't see any plain old numbers hanging out. I don't see any variables that aren't connected, okay, that aren't bonded with a number. So basically, in this first one, it's just going to be the two quantities. I'm done. Okay, don't make this harder than it needs to be. B, I kind of made that one easy, too. Yeah, I was going to say, I have a coefficient, but I don't have any other ones, so I don't have to worry about it. I have a single variable, but it's not like I have multiple ones, so I don't have to worry about it. There's no quantities. Okay, that's not bad. What about C, though? Factor the second one. Factor the second one. So what's that second one going to look like after I've factored it? What multiplies to negative 16 and adds to positive 6? 8, okay, eight negative. and negative 2. So once I have that, we'll get rid of the old one so I don't get confused. And then basically, yeah. I have an x minus 2. I have an x plus 8. Remember, though, it's only on largest exponent. It doesn't mean, ooh, I see two of these, so I'm going to put squared. No, you better not. The only time we use, use squared is if we actually see one in one of the terms. So that's not bad. All right, if possible, simplify the rational expression. So factor if you can. And if you can't, then we'll see if we can start canceling. So let's see. What can I do in number one? Take out an X. OK, take out an X. So what's that going to leave me with? 3X plus 2. OK, 3X plus 2. OK, so wipe that out. X. Right. By doing that, now this X has been singled out. Once that x has been singled out, and I don't see a strong bond here, now I can start playing with these. So knowing, going by my exponent rules, 2 minus 1 would be x to the first. There's my larger exponent. Okay, Or I could have just canceled an x if I wanted to. But 
I just wanted to remind myself then that that 3x minus 2 is bonded down here. No more wiping out x's. That's all you can do. All right, let's check out this next one. Any factoring available in the numerator? All right, we got a difference of squares. So 2x plus 7, 2x minus 7. And again, if at this point you're staring at these, you're going, I don't know, I don't see. You need to go back and look at some of those factoring lessons because it's just one of those you've got to get used to over time. I can keep saying it over and over, but it's got to be something that kind of you reinforce. All right, so we got that set. Down here, you either need to play with the mental math or if that's not your strong suit, then you need to slide and divide. Okay. Now, if you don't see where that came from, again, I could swing this down to the end. Factor this one, because it's just multiply to 14 and add to 9. Which should be negative 7 and negative 2. But then I've got to go back through and divide by the 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1, so there's my x minus 1. 7 over 2 doesn't reduce anymore, so that 2 will swing back to the front. 2x minus 7. Either way, perfectly acceptable to work with. And now, those are identical, so they can cancel. And I'm good. Again, these are bonded with that plus or minus. I can see the bond. I cannot, cannot, cannot cancel those x's out. So then we get away from single terms. We go into multiples. So I see this first one's multiply. Now, you could go cancel crazy at the start. Nothing wrong with that. But, again, my suggestion for the most part has been I like getting it down into one fraction and working with it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to multiply straight across and get it into one fraction first and now start to reduce. And again, with the way the calculators are anymore, life gets simple with this. The 192 over 100, now, if I can mentally do it, great. Oops, if I can mentally do it, great. If not, well, we just go back to where we know we can get a little help. Okay, so 48 over 25. I'm not going to need this again for a little bit. So now let's see. I've only got x's in the denominator. They're nowhere else. So I know that's going to be all right. What about the y's? What's that? Yep, subtract them. So 5 minus 1 is 4, but the larger exponent was in the numerator. So that's where my answer goes, and I'm good. Again, the further we get with these, you kind of see it's kind of starting to ramp up a little bit as you go further, which kind of gives you a chance to see how this is all working. Now, what's different about 4, besides the numbers, of course, than 3? Yeah, now it's division. So not only, yeah, we're going to flip the second one when we get there. But for now... I see that x to the 6. Can I factor, bless you, you, the denominator in number 4? No. Yeah. Alright, x plus 6, x minus 6. Difference of squares. But now when I get to here and I see the division, I'm going to change it to multiplication, and I'm going to take the reciprocal. I'm going to flip it.
And I can look and say, okay, well, I see that these x plus 6s are the same, so I can wipe them out. The other thing that I notice, I start looking here, and I'm like, okay, this is just like division. I know they're not in one fraction yet, but it's the same idea. So 6 minus 4 would be x squared up in the numerator, because that's where the larger exponent's at. So that'll actually take care of our x's here. And then all I see that's left is a 4 and this x minus 6. And there's nothing left to cancel. So it is. It's just basically a step-by-step -step process. Factor or take out a greatest common factor and then start looking to see what we've got to work with. No factoring. Woohoo. the second fraction Flip the second fraction, and I'm with you. We'll just go ahead and we'll multiply across here. So 84x to the fourth, and 224x to the fifth. What's that? Why am I going brain dead right now? Did you say eight? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then write. Since it's five minus four is one, larger exponents down below this time, three over eight x. And yes, it matters where the x goes. <clears throat> Gotta always be with that larger exponent. Let's see here. Nothing to factor in my first fraction in number 6. I'm going to turn my second term here into a fraction. So I'm going to put the 2x minus 5 over 1. And then my last one, it's division. So I'm going to flip it, but as I flip it, What's my new denominator going to factor into? What can I do with 4x squared minus 25? All right, 2x plus 5, 2x minus 5. Now that I've done all of my flipping and my factoring, cancel a whole bunch out. So the x plus 3's go away, the 2x minus 5 goes away, and I've got x over 2x plus 5, and again, the 2x and 5 are bonded by the plus. Do not try to wipe out the x's. So when we're multiplying or dividing, we're, kind of, we're really flexible in what we can do. We don't have to play with common denominators, just factor and start canceling. Now when we start getting into... Add and subtract, though, now it gets a little more interesting. Whoa. And nice, I even give the reminder on common denominators. But again, run down your three things to make sure everything's going all right. I don't see any single coefficients. I don't see any single variable terms. I just see two different quantities, x plus 3 and x minus 2. So that will create my new denominator. And we go into building mode again. Whatever I had in my old one and my new one, I'll just check off. And whatever doesn't get checked off, is what I need up in my new numerator. Because again, if I were to go canceling right now, which I'm not, if I cancel those, I'd get my original fraction back. And that's the idea. I've got the x minus 2 in the second one. I need an x plus 3. So basically now, I'm ready to get down to one fraction. 
So if I distribute, so I'll have 4x here, and I'll have 2x here, so 4x plus 2x is 6x. 4 times negative 2 would be negative 8. 2 times 3 is 6, so negative 8 plus 6 is a negative 2 or a minus 2. That's true. Even though I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to cancel anymore or not, if I can factor the numerator, I always should, just for that rare instance when I might be able to do something else. So since I can get a 2 out of each of those, I'm going to. And I take one last peek to make sure there's nothing else I can do. No identical sets of parentheses. Nothing to mess with that 2 on. And again, either of these would be acceptable, but it's going to be one of those cases sometime when you don't go ahead and factor it and something would have canceled that you're going to get nabbed. So I'd always just do it just to be sure. All right, let's see here. Number eight. Number eight. What is my brand new? 12. Okay, 10x, because when I'm doing these, I look at my coefficient part first, the 5 and the 10. If I were to start counting by 5s and 10s, what's the first number they have in common? 10. And then the x is there, so I have to have that. I'll recopy what I have up in the numerator of my fraction. And then I start building. So to get from 5 to 10x, what do I need? 2x, because 5 times 2 is 10, and I don't have the x yet. And the second one, well, I already have 10x. I don't need anything else. So I go back and I go, okay, 3x times 2x is 6x squared plus 4 over 10x. Now I got two questions here now. At this point right now, before I do anything else, can I whack these x's right now? Nine. Not yet. Can I factor out something in the numerator, though? Yes. yes. So if I take out a 2, I've got 3x squared plus 2. Now can I whack something? Yes. Yes, because now this 2 has been freed from the bond. So now the 2 and the 10 can reduce. So 2 goes into 10 five times. Now I'm done. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying once you get to the end of one fraction, you want to go ahead and factor it if you can because there may be one other small thing that you're going to be able to do to simplify it. If you don't do that part, you stop here. Partially right, but not completely right. So be cautious. Number nine. Looks like we got some factoring to do. What's my first denominator going to factor to? X minus 7, X minus 2. Okay, so X minus 7. X minus 2, because negative times negative is positive, and negative 7 and negative 2 add up to negative 9. Okay, so we get rid of that because we don't want to get confused. And that actually ends up being my LCD this time. So we'll recopy everything else. Then again, it just becomes building my fraction. Well, my first one. Everything checks out, so I don't need anything else. Second fraction, check off the x minus 2. I need an x minus 7. And again, we're ready to get down to one fraction. The second fraction, i got to distribute a little bit, so I'll end up with 2x minus 14. So let's see here. 5x and 2x is 7x. Negative 14 
negative 1 is negative 15. I look at the numerator, can't take anything out of there, nothing's identical, we're good. So sometimes nothing's going to happen. That's okay. Alright, let's see if we get caught on this next one. I don't think we're going to, but let's see. Alright, 10. Ooh. Common denominator. Yeah, what's my common denominator on 10? X minus 6. X minus 6, it's already common. You're like, okay, well this one's easy. I just do this and aha. Uh -huh. No. No. I got a 6. Okay, right. I still, even though it had a common denominator already, still need to factor if I can because check out what happens. Identical parentheses. I get all the way down to just 6. So even if it's a common denominator, always look. Keep looking for that opportunity to factor all the way until the end. All right. Second fraction in number 11. Factored denominator, please. All right. X plus 4. X plus 3. Cross that out. And that actually ends up being my common denominator. So I go, okay, let's see. Got my common denominator. Check off what I have. Didn't check off the x plus 4, so I need that. Second one, I got everything. So I'm like, okay, let's see what we got working here. Single fraction. So yeah, let's just write this one out. We got 8x plus 32. That minus, and why I put this in parentheses, you're like, why'd you move that to parentheses? This minus, I'm subtracting the whole quantity. That minus has got to go to the x squared and the negative 6. So I've got negative x squared and plus 6. And a lot of times if you don't put the parentheses, you'll forget about that. So let's see here. Negative x squared plus 8x plus 38. Let's think about this for just a second here. Multiplies to 38. 19 and 2 or 38 and 1, neither of those are getting me to 8. Okay. So again, when we're adding or subtracting, it's about building your fractions and then seeing if you can factor it again at the end. But you've got to take your time because there's lots of little detail stuff that can nab you if you try to go 100 miles an hour. Yes, ma'am. Um, the extra credit sheet isn't listed on the check, but I'll have a reminder up there. No, I mean, like, is, it the, is there is the answer sheet in there? I'm not sure. I think so, though. It might be in the front folder. Okay. So let me go flipping here. Like, oh, here comes this graphing again. Okay, graphing, we're going to do some reminders as we go through with these. We're also going to give ourselves a little backup on the calculator to kind of give us some reminders on some stuff. All right, x-intercepts. How do you find the x-intercept when you're graphing? And there, uh, yes, numerator equal to zero. Now, I'm going to warn you, there's a distinct possibility that on this quiz tomorrow, some of you remember it from the last quiz where I had the three questions. How do you find the horizontal asymptote? How do you find the vertical? How do you find the x-intercept? That question may be popping up again. So if you're not sure, you might want to go back and review that a little bit. 
Um, yeah, I'll let you, if you're looking to retake that last quiz, it'll be through Tuesday next week. So we've got three days this week. So yeah, since I always do a week, we'll get those couple, first couple of days of next week too, if you want to. Quick question. If you have a polynomial So we don't have any x-intercepts. How do I find vertical asymptotes? Set the denominator equal to 0. And again, you can either solve this like an equation where you add 9 and then take the square root. That would work. Or you can also go ahead and factor it since it's a difference of squares. So x equals 3 and negative 3. And like I said before, I normally start drawing these in as I find them because it'll be a nice check for me when I actually get to the point where I'm ready to graph things. All right, horizontal. We are bottom heavy because we have a larger exponent down below. Remember what bottom heavy gets us. It might be y equals 0. Now remember, you can have part of your graph go through your horizontal asymptote. But let's see what this looks like to see if we're on the right track here. All right, so we got 3 divided by, oops, that would have gotten me in trouble. Again, if you have a quantity that you want in one of these fractions, you've got to make sure the parentheses are there. Because if I'd have forgotten them like I started to at the beginning, it would have done 3 divided by x squared and then minus 9, which isn't what we want. All right, so let's see what this looks like. Now remember, I'm going to keep stressing this. This does not mean this graph goes to here and then goes down. It just blends in so close to the asymptote that you don't see it continue to go upward. Same here. This is going to continue to go upward. Do not cut off your graph. If you need help with that, if you hit second graph, bring your table up. Again, look at several values as you start to graph this. The error is my asymptote. That's good. And I can start to look and say, okay, so this one kind of starts going downward. And I know that can get tricky because you're looking at this, you're going, well, how do I know that's going to start going up? Remember, this asymptote is just kind of your borderline. It's going to hug it. So I know as this comes up closer, it's just going to hug it and keep going. If I look on the other side of my error, <coughs> I'll see that same thing is going to happen. It comes downward here, but that'll go up. Now, as far as the middle's concerned, between my errors, I'm just going to plot them all. So negative 0 0.6, negative 0.375, and that ends up being symmetrical. So let the calculator guide you somewhat in finding your graph and plotting your points, but don't just copy identically what you see because you don't necessarily see the whole picture with that. And then that one would be set. So we move down a little bit. Then we start the process over again. So x-intercepts, numerator equal to 0. So I'd subtract the 4 and divide by 3. So negative 4 thirds, like, ooh, it's going to be an interesting graph already. Vertical asymptote. Set the denominator equal to 0, which gets me x equals 3. And 
and then horizontal, my x's are the same, which is equal weight, so I just divide the coefficients. So divide the 3 over 4, so y equals 3 fourths, and that's going this way. So once I get that situated, I go, all right, let's see here. Again, if you have binomial terms, make sure they're in parentheses. Otherwise, you're going to get one goofy looking graph. All right, let's see how this looks. Okay, now this looks sensible. Here's my vertical asymptote out at, th out at about 3. That looks good. And I notice this is going just above the x-axis, just above it here, which makes me think my vertical, excuse me, my horizontal asymptote's also good. So let's take a look at some values here. If I'm looking off to the right of my vertical asymptote, got a point at 4, 4. And again, I'm just going to use a few points to get a general idea of what my branch is going to look like. And I'll go to the other side and take a peek. Again, typically I'm going to use these three points that are on either side of my vertical asymptote. So here I'd have two, I'd be negative two and a half. One, just a little less. And at zero, I'm just a little less. Oops, I started to curve a little too soon. And get that in there. And I can always go back and look at my graph one more time. So those look similar. Yeah, those look similar. Okay, this is looking good. I'm feeling good with this. Kind of make that go away. And finally, these things still aren't going to change. Set your numerator equal to zero. In this case, factor it. So positive 7 and negative 2 will multiply to negative 14 and add up to 5 which means when I set each of these quantities equal to zero, I end up with x-intercepts at two and negative seven. My vertical asymptote, I set the denominator equal to zero. So we enjoy having three on about every problem we do. Now, horizontal, we are top heavy. There is no horizontal asymptote, but there's a slight clue there. Obliques. Oblique in capital letters. Now, obliques, two options. I'm going to show you both because some of you like it one way, some of you like it the other. So here goes nothing. I can either... Do regular long division with this. So where I'd have x minus 3, and then I'd have x squared plus 5x minus 14. And I would look at my first terms. So x into x squared would be x. And at that point, I distribute this x through. So x times x is x squared. x times negative 3 is negative 3x. And then I subtract that. Because the whole idea of this long division is that my first term is going to keep canceling. x squared minus x squared, yep, that cancels. That's good. 5 minus negative 3 is like 5 plus 3. So that would be 8x. And I just bring my last term down 
and I start the process over again. So x into 8x is positive 8, and I do it again. I distribute it through. So 8 times x is 8x. 8 times negative 3 is negative 24. Those guys cancel. Minus a negative makes this negative 14 plus 24 is 10. I'm done. I don't care about the remainder. My oblique is y equals x plus 8. Now put that in in a minute. But I want to make sure that I show you the other option if long division just drives you crazy. And here's what that other option would be. I can use synthetic division on this, but here's the kicker. See how that's x minus 3? You have to use the opposite sign if you're going to do synthetic. So if this is a plus, this is negative. But since it's minus, this is plus. And then you just take the coefficients of each of the terms in your numerator. I bring the first term down. Okay, I don't do anything with that one. Multiply it times my divisor, so 1 times 3 is 3. Add down. 8 times 3 is 24. Add down. And once you get those in, you go back and you say, okay, I started with a degree of 2, so I go one less than that, so x plus 8, and then this ends up being my remainder, but there's the x plus 8 that I was talking about. Okay? Either of those work. So once I have it, no matter which way it is, I need to graph that oblique in like I'm graphing a line. So my y-intercept is at 8, and my slope is 1. So up 1 and right, 1 up and right, up and right. And I just tend to like fill in dots as far as I can go because what that's going to do is it's going to let me make a very accurate, or down and left, lets me make a very accurate asymptote. Because again, asymptotes are dotted or dashed. And I won't see those typically when I go to graph my line if I look at it on the calculator. Whoa, you're not supposed to take the whole graph with you. So again, my numerator needs to be in parentheses. And so does my denominator. So when I graph this, like that looks kind of funky, but here's where I can double check to make sure my obliques working. If I go back and go down to y sub 2 here and just type in my oblique, x plus 8, and I go to graph it, you notice as it's coming down, it's hugging my graph as it starts to go off the screen. So. Now, I wouldn't necessarily want that up when I go to my table, because if I go to my table now, ooh, I got numbers everywhere. This is confusing. I don't want confusing. So once I see it looks good, I'm going to clear my other one out. Okay, now I can get some values to work with. Like, but I can't even put some of these values on. Look at how ridiculous these numbers are. Okay, then let's just plot the ones that are sensible. So if I look here, I'm like... All right, let's see. So if I go to, I see at 2, that's 0. OK, so 1, 4. Keep working my way backwards here. 0 is almost up to 5. Negative 1's coming back down. Negative 2 is coming back down. So I get a general idea here. And I'm good because the rest of my graph is going to go so far the other direction that I'm not even going to be able to get it on here because I'd have another curve somewhere up here. 
but the graph's really not helping me out with that, so we can just come to this part. And that's basically what we're looking at. So again, if this is still bothering you later, a couple of suggestions, watch any parts of this again, or you might even want to take an extra copy of this, print it off, because I've got a copy of it on the website, and see if you can do this without, and then you've got an answer key to kind of come back to.